All right, everyone. So welcome back to the show. I have a great guest today, uh, Patrick Jones. And Patrick, before I have you take over, I just want to kind of give a quick background on uh, kind of like what I wanted to focus on today. And I think you'd be like a great representative for that. And, and I don't actually know the state of affairs in Australia currently, but I presume it's fairly similar to the U US in the sense that there's like a huge health crisis, you know, so in the US, yeah, I mean, in the US right now, like nine out of 10 American adults are, are metabolically sick. I'm not even exaggerating that, uh, that statistic with, uh, you know, close to 30% of females being on some type of psychiatric drug, and then 70 to 80% of people being on some type of medical drug altogether, et cetera, et cetera. Yep. And, um, you know, the cancer rates are very high, 50%, 60% of people develop cancer and half of them die from it. Close to 800,000 people die from heart attacks every year. So these are huge numbers and I'm not even listing everything. Um, and I'm just thinking kind of like people are living like a very unsustainable lifestyle model that's leading to a lot of these health symptoms. And unfortunately, like a lot of people, because they don't have like a reference point of other lifestyles, they kind of just go along with it, you know, and they kind of normalize a lot of times unsustainable lifestyle patterns or like normalize like mental and physical illness, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, it's tough to change when you don't see that contrast. And I just brought you on, uh, on board to have like a, as a great guest and you can take the conversation any way you like. Honestly, I would really love to hear your story because I'm pretty sure possibly at one point in your life, you're stuck in exactly that same model. But then you kind of woke up one day and you're like, well, this isn't the direction I want to go and it's not very sustainable and et cetera, et cetera. And you decided to make the changes. So uh, you're welcome to take over. You're welcome to take it in any direction you'd like as well. Mm, thanks. Thanks to Eugene. <laughs> That's a great um, introduction and a good compost to um, set this conversation. Yeah, so in Australia, um, we have very similar health and education systems to the U US. In fact, um, while there are you know, progressive examples of education and health all around the world, Australia continues to go to the US for uh, health and education um, and, uh, and uh, uh, the way in which we do agriculture. And this is uh, created, yeah, obesity and diabetes, type two epidemics, um, and lots of anxiety and depression in the culture, uh, and yeah, um, chronic disease, like the the escalation of chronic disease, particularly in the last two decades. And it was about two decades ago um, that my very new girlfriend now two decade old girlfriend, Meg, uh, and I got together and we um, had different environmentalisms. Um, Meg was, you know, a bike rider and public transport user. And I had been a forest activist and really, yeah, really concerned about um, the state of the ecologies of, of wild, wild ecologies in Australia. Um, but slowly, when we got together, we we merged our environmentalisms and integrated a lot more uh, things and found our way to permaculture, which is this um, framework uh, rather than dogma. It's like a set of ethics and principles that people can apply in a specific context, specific social um, context and, and cultural context. So it's there's no kind of one way to do permaculture, but it, it, what permaculture really focuses on is our reclamation of our food, medicine, and energy resources. The way we move around or heat our homes, the way we um, procure food and, and connect to the origin stories of food, and the way in which we uh, get our medicine, that is not 100% on the industrial medicine um, uh, kind of um, treadmill and I think you know maybe uh, listeners to your podcast would be already on board that um, big pharma is a highly extractive industry it it needs it's a, a kind of the world's biomes terrains have been colonized um, 
pretty severely over the last several centuries. But what hasn't been um, is our bodies as if we think about bodies as forests of microbes and our bodies as parts that are much more than human as well as human cells, um, pharma is kind of really, this has been going on 100 years, but particularly very radically in the last 20 years, big pharma has been seeing that our the human body is a place for colonization. It's a terrain for colonization. And so the more we're on meds, um, the better for pharma, but not necessarily the better for us. And I think a lot of people are waking up to that. And also our food as well. Um, uh, while we've never had so much cheap food available, so much uh, cheap energy through food available, um, the food has got progressively more toxic as industry has cut more and more corners. And so... And with energy, um, because of the availability of cheap, cheap crude energy, and now the kind of um, uh, the, the the green energy revolution, which instead of being a methadone program to crude oil, it's actually trying to match crude oil one to one. So therefore, we're not seeing a powering down of our energetic uses. We're seeing more and more electric devices, which requires more and more mining. So like if we just look at energy, food and medicine as three things that we can actually take charge of in our own personal lives, and those capitalisms are very dominant in terms of enslaving us, putting us into debt um, and, you know, making, making our bodies quite impoverished, but also the psychological aspects of that. Like if we don't have meaning and purpose and connection to the what I call the living of the world, it's very difficult to stay well mentally. And if we're not well mentally, it, it informs our body. But also the reverse. Uh, if we're putting crap into our system because we're on the run, we're on the go, we don't have time to prepare food. Um, and you know, we're smashing our microbiome of our gut uh, with with you know really sort of highly acidic foods and you know too much carbs and um, you know, and also just all the impurities that are coming from industrial agriculture um, being kind of composted in our guts. And then that informs, I see the gut as a first brain, not a second brain. That informs through the vagus nerve to our heart, you know, all of our central, uh, all of our, sorry, nervous systems, but our central nervous system. So when we feel shit because we, you know, might have done a few burgers and a couple of Cokes or something, we, 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 we had there. I have noticed when I when I used to be a builder, um, I would put crap in my body and I would feel shit and I would get very negative. And I guess the story Meg and I are telling um, through our website, Artist's Family, we over the last two decades we've really arrested um, the dependency. We've mitigated to a large degree our dependency on industrial food, medicine, and energy. And the story is one of, you know, we started with anger that we were born into a culture that is poisoning us through through mainly those three capitalisms. And I should just go back a bit. What I mean by industrial energy, how that's poisoning us is that it's making us passive. We're sitting in cars instead of riding to work. We're using, you know, energy, uh, you know, industrial energy to heat our houses so that we're extremely temperature domesticated, which is um, really problematic for our immune system. Um, and, you know, creating a kind of um, body fog rather than a mind fog, um, the more passive we are. So the more available energy we have, the more, the less passive we are, or we have to go out to a gym. And what we've found is that in order to change things around, we had to create a kind of green gym practice. So instead of, you know, our hour of meditation or yoga, or not that we were doing those things, but like many people have practices by, by sort of middle age, people realize that they need some sort of practice of life to keep them well mentally and physically. And so what instead of having a practice of yoga or a practice of going to the gym, we call it green gym. 
where we're making our own food, we're foraging and hunting and, and bringing in um, medicine and food and energy because we will burrow our, our wood. Uh, we, we, our context is we live on the edge of a forest and eucalypts in Australia are the fastest uh, growing trees in the world, actually. So we've got an endless supply of walked for energy, which powers our home. It runs several appliances often at once with the one log. Uh, and we can walk for that. So, you know, I, I, I do a wheelbarrow a day and I go to the forest and I push it up the hill and it's my green gym. I sweat for 20 minutes a day. Um, I'm 53 and I feel um, I've never felt better in my life. And no one in our family has gone to a doctor, a, a general practitioner, for seven years. Um, so since making this switch um, where we don't have stress or anxiety or depression in our lives, we've had some big grief stories um, and we've had the time to open to those. And I think an Indigenous um, American called Martin Prechtel talks about um depression being the repression of grief. And so when we have, everyone has grief, whether it be saying goodbye to your 11 year old as they're turning 12, there's a little grief there. Sometimes it's a much bigger one, like the loss of a loved one. Um, but all of us have little griefs all the time. And if we don't open to those, uh, you know, it, it ends up in being depression and anxiety. And because we don't have time to, engage with the wildness of grief, then it becomes like a civilizational depression or anxiety. So I feel like in many respects, our journey has been putting back the pieces of a holistic way of life, a practice of life that um, means that we've got healthy food and yet we live well below the poverty line. Um, we only, our economy is only 20% reliant on the global pool of money, the, the, the dominant um, economy. And we're 80% reliant on what we call a flow of gifts economy that is in, embedded um, in what we call community sufficiency rather than self-sufficiency. The self-sufficiency is this um, problematic term for us because it's saying you must do everything in the household to procure all your resources. Whereas if you're in uh, a community sufficiency, it's like we do these things and we've got some surplus or abundance. So we, we let those flow. And then the next household has that abundance or surplus that flows back to us. And so there's about 80 households in our town where we're in this trusting flow of gifts uh, economy where we it's not registered. It's not like a barter system. Barter is important for building trust, but once the trust is established, it's just an unregistered flow of gifts. And it means that everyone has each other's back. And so, um, you know, in terms of food and, you know, if someone gets an ailment like arthritis, for example, well, I'm often the go-to guy because I had arthritis in my hands as a builder for many years. And then a wonderful herbalist in America called Susan S. Weed, I was listening to a podcast where she's using stinging nettle um, to uh, do a kind of crude form of acupuncture in my hands. And I have cured my arthritis in my hands through two things, uh, running them through stinging nettle. And stinging nettle is an incredible good food medicine to have in um, in your garden. Um, but, although there are a few different types and some are really strong. The ones we have wild here in Australia are, are mild. And then um, cold water plunging. And so that is incredibly good for um, uh, inflammation of any form. So because we use our bodies physically, we start the day with a half hour stretch while the, the kettle is coming to a boil. And then we sit in cold water for five minutes. And the last three mornings, we've had to smash the ice on the, on the outdoor tank that we've cut the top off and that to where Meg and I uh, sit for five minutes and it's an acceptance ritual it's a challenge to start the day with and then everything after that in the day is actually quite easy <laughs> after you sat in ice, icy water for five minutes so but i you know just the alertness of brain the um the, 
the processing of inflammation in the body from a, a, the previous day's hard work. I've had a night of rest. Luckily, I am a good sleeper, but my partner Meg only gets about four hours a, a night sleep. And But with all these things and good food and the cold water and all the herbal medicines, um, she's spent a lifetime. She's just turned 50. She spent a lifetime trying to work out how to get good sleep and tried absolutely everything but it um that's her achilles heel that's her thing that she uh lives with and um and there's more acceptance there and the more the deeper the acceptance of that um while also supporting herself with good food and medicine and an active um life way she um she manages, not just manages really well, she's incredibly productive and has the capacity to be in service to many people uh, in, in our community. Um, Meg and I both run, respectively, um, men's and women's circles. So deep listening, where we um, men come on a couple of, uh, couple of Sunday evenings a month um, to speak, to to. Yeah, sit in, in the forest in on common land to um, behold a, a fire and to practice deep listening, um, sharing what's going on with us. And that's, I'm really passionate about men's health and Meg is passionate about women's health and she runs the women's circle, which is called For Crying Out Loud. And then together we co-facilitate a forest school. Basically, and the principles of that forest school are uh, to impart to not just our own children, but actually other children uh, in the, in our village um, and further afield, how to be soft-hearted and open and yet hard-bodied, resilient. And so the deep we always start with um, and end the day with a, a deep listening circle and just teaching the children from eight to sometimes as high as 14, um, how to listen, how to listen to our brothers and sisters. And so I think like I'm what I, I guess I'm trying to to demonstrate is just all the things that we've done to rebuild the village, because it's not just about having organic food. And in fact, if it is and that organic food is bought, it's a very class-based thing. Like not many people can afford to eat organic food. But if we turn uh, if we turn from, say, a practice of meditation or yoga or some other practice, um, uh, like going to the gym or some sort of well-being practice into a much more holistic practice where when you're weeding your vegetables, that's your meditation. When you're weeding your vegetables, it's also how you hold your body so your back doesn't ache. And in fact, you, you the way in which we we kind of recalibrate uh, what we call neo a neo peasant or a new peasant cosmology is um, by walking with buckets that are uneven and building a stability in our lower back and the stretching every morning is really important. But like knowing that our ancestors, it wasn't all about just even dumbbells and pushing them up. It was actually I'm talking to a myotherapist friend of mine, John, who's really helped my back when I used to be a builder. And he he's looking into the um, the ethnography of uh, our peasant ancestral or indigenous ancestors' bodies. And they were quite capable of like hard beds. Um, we, we, we used to equate in eth um, in the sciences that our ancestors had bad backs and they didn't live very long. Um, that is actually uh, a myth. The records, uh, the medical records begin in England in the middle of the 1700s. And by then the peasantry are so malnourished. So they've been mostly kicked off the commons. They're getting ready to be put down or if they're already in the mines and in the factories of the burgeoning industrial era. Um, and and there's very little time for culture, whereas our peasant ancestry of the Middle Ages in Europe is if we're not being totally oppressed by the landlords or the, the ruling elite, there is time for culture making where many 
celebrations and uh, ceremonies take place in common land, song, dance, story, food. All of this stuff comes together uh, to keep the village healthy and strong and dynamic in its culture making. Um, but then with the witch hunts and then the factories and the mines basically taking over and and the peasants having to be shunted, like kicked off the commons, enclosed from being able to self-provision or community provision. And then, um, you know, the, the assault against women and the assault against men as well, so that the men were exiled from the household and community economies and put into the industrial servitude economies. And then on the way home from that miserable work would go to the pub, get pierced, come home home and beat the women. So this is how we've got this trauma in us as a culture. And I think that if we don't understand where we've come from, if we don't understand who our ancestors were and how they lived, and while, you know, we don't take everything from the past, we don't dress in period costume, we're not romanticizing peasants per se, but our peasant ancestors had land bonded ways and ceremonies and celebrations. And we know that we know that there was richness in the culture and also there was more gender dis distribution, which we're never told. So by the time the middle of, middle of the 1700s comes along, when the medical records begin in a European sense in England, the peasantry are sick, malnourished, um, ready to be transported to colonies like Australia and America uh, and bring that trauma here and then dispossess the indigenous uh, folk of those of that so-called new world, which of course is old cultures, um, old and deeply um, uh, land bonded cultures. So yeah, I, I feel like the story of colonization, is still living on in a very disguised way through our medicine, food, and, and energy. And if we don't understand that, we can't really develop individual or household or neighborhood or community approaches to reclaiming um, the rich food and medicine. That, you know, our herbal medicine from Europe um, is the people's medicine. It's always been known as that, and it was held by women power. And before the witch hunts, um, birth doulas and midwives and herbalists and dispute resolvers, this was all women's business. And that feminine power in the village was revered. Um, so that was smashed. And so people think, you know, patriarchy has always been this horrendous thing that just constantly existed. But actually... If we look at books like uh, Caliban and the Witch, for example, um, that shows the records that things weren't exactly like that. And also the invention of capitalism um, by an American scholar called um, Michael Perelman, I think, um, showed all the manipulations that had to take place to get the peasants to stop um, community and self-provisioning. So, it, you know, capitalism was presented as a a natural uh, economy, economic system. And in a way, if capitalism is just the local market, so that subsistence is first, so the honouring of the household food system, the family food system, and then surplus second into the flow of gifts economy, the neighbours and doing one uh, good deeds for each other to build um, social bonds. And then third tier is the money economy, where you then take whatever's left over to the local market and strangers and enemies, um, to use that David Graber uh, quote around money in his incredible book, Debt, The First 5,000 Years, um, strangers and enemies economy is the third tier, the monet monetary economy. But by having money as the first tier of economy, um, it, it basically means that we are constantly in an unsustainable an extractive economic reality that's based on debt and scarcity, not abundance and flow. <sighs> so I guess that's just trying to sort of lay a compost of the sorts of understandings historically, what we can do as a household and a community to, to powerfully say no to big corporate life 
basically bringing many toxins into our bodies, into our homes. Yeah, and uh, I mean, you brought up so much. I've been taking notes here so we can kind of revisit some of these, these ideas in a little bit more detail. Um, but I feel like one of the one of the difficulties of kind of regaining your health and uh, discontinuing a life of like normalized mental and physical pathology is I feel like people, it's very, very difficult because people kind of try to heal themselves while living in a toxic environment, unsustainable work schedules, like both in your case, since you're a family man, like here you have now both parents working full time and a lot of parents still not making ends meet and then plus they got to take care of a kid or two kids or even a dog as well and it's like by the time you know you plus they're unhealthy you know so their energy levels are low you know you get up with like five hours of sleep uh you take some antidepressants quickly take some coffee you know quickly run up rush off to work it's like it's very stressful in the central nervous system to be on the freeway crazy deadlines at work plus unhealthy co-workers also at work bringing all of that kind of energy to work. Then you got McDonald's for lunch or whatever, and then some more four hours of nonsense. And then you get back on the freeway traffic and then you get home, you're like dead tired already. You got to still spend time with the kids. And uh, I feel like also the the medical system love, loves that symptom management model. No one's even talking about you know changing the foundation of a person's life or moreover changing the person that's causing the disease. You know, you go to the doctors, you get five minutes max here. They talk about symptoms, never the behaviors that are leading to those symptoms. And then here's a pill. If you're still alive in three months, come back to me. You know, you might have probably another side effect from this pill. So we'll just give you another one to give you a few more years. And then we'll just kind of repeat this cycle. And it's kind of, um, and I always say like, uh, and there are a lot of smart people in the healthcare industry too, but I feel they're also very stuck in that model, because instead of figuring out a way how to just step out of the swamp, they're figuring out how to wait a way to live in the swamp, you know, like tinker with this, tinker with that. How could we, we elongate that? I'm like, dude, it's so simple. Like just get out of the swamp and your body naturally heals. And I feel a lot of people probably at some level, there are no absolutes, but probably at some level want to step out, but they don't know how to step out. So maybe especially if they have kids, you know, and stuff of this sort, it might not be that easy. So I was wondering maybe if you can give uh, your story of like when you're thoroughly embedded in that system and when you, when you came to the epiphany of like, dude, enough is enough. Like I can't go on like this or, or maybe if you didn't even do that, but kind of your backstory. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That, that is what you described before was yeah very much the stress uh, I was under before 20 years ago. And um, yeah, I think it's for us, it's been a very gradual step-by-step -step, um, set of behavior changes. And if we went too fast, we would get demoralized. If we went too slow, it would be demoralizing. So just the first few years were very difficult, but we, we, we intentionally said, I, I had a lot of anger. Um, Meg had other emotions come up, um, but we both knew as a couple that we wanted to make big changes. So we knew what we were leaving behind, but we just didn't know what we were moving towards. And in, in many ways, that's the same thing. So it's trusting, tr building trust was probably the first thing. How far can we take this thing? How we are now 100% reliant on industrial food, medicine and energy. Um, how can we in a few years be 95% reliant on those things or, you know, and so we started the, the very, some of the very first things we did, we had two cars. Um, I wanted to stay at home. Uh, I w I'd done the maths and basically as a builder with my ute and all my tools and the wear and tear and the depreciation of those big uh, tools, um, I was basically just paying bills i was going sideways i'm not a, i've never been a great business person i would end up in, on a work site and um meet the client in the morning and an hour later instead of doing work the client would still be saying well we could change this or oh, well, what about this and you know and instead of going home and you know exhausted that night and writing up the diff you know that the sort of 
uh, the differences that should have appeared in the quote and and that should have been charged. I was I just wanted to spend time with my partner and my children. So um, it it I I was so wrung out and depleted um, as a builder, and I I also um, yeah I was doing other things too. I, I'm a poet and a songmaker and a filmmaker and you know art and making story i was trying to get back to that as well so not just coming back to the household but i was trying to make you know enough money to get back into my studio and so i was just feeling incredibly frustrated and very angry for the state of the world i had bad food choices because i was just as you said i was just like putting in my body some stimulant uh, that would keep me going and then I would you know be grumpy by the end of the day and wrung out and so you know it wasn't you know there was so many stresses so I really empathize with how you painted that picture was with deep compassion um, for the way in which people's lives are sort of ushered and crafted pretty much from the industrial school system into the workplace um, but also all the time you know, especially from a young man, just looking critically at the culture I was born into and loving some things of it, but absolutely hating many things of it. And and as a as an artist and poet, I was, you know, really writing to um, some of these problems. And so I was developing a kind of very masculine, intellectual, rational uh, anger against my culture. And that was helpful that i guess that was me and my young warrior body saying enough is enough i'm not going to be uh, extracted from uh, by these big greedy corporations and and you know the business well uh, the business realm that while you know my parents are small business people and i've been a small business person i've had a, a, a bookshop for a while and i've, I've you know as a, as a carpenter and builder i've had a small business it's more those bigger scale, um, very invasive um, uh, industries that, uh, you know, my petrol, for example, or the, the supermarket food, um, they're the things that I wanted to say no to. And I knew they were the the point of my unhappiness. And, and even though I was in my mid-30s then, I knew that my body was starting to not be able to just keep responding to this crap, this high, uh, high acidic and toxic food and medicine. So, and I was getting sick all the time as well. Unhappy people, colds, flus. Um, I, I was one of those. So, yeah. So just getting desperate and really wanting to take some ownership and empowerment back into my life and Meg, Meg too. And so it was a step-by-step -step thing and every little thing we got rid of opened us up in terms of like resource or for example we got rid of our first car and i i sold my car um and stayed at home and started growing food meg kept working um and we parked her car in the carport um, with a logbook beside it and wrote down over the course of a year how many times we actually need a car. So for us, car use, even though we didn't have fancy cars, was a huge amount of uh, our income needed. And so therefore, by getting rid of some of these big industrial tools, um, we found that it was, given, you know, we were uh, more cash poor, but more time rich. And I was converting that time into healthy food and the time to go up to the local tip and, and go through the scrap metal pile to find good bits of hardware to build the tool that I needed to, you know, build a new, I don't know, um, outside rocket stove to, to do our summer cooking. Or, you know, I was basically, instead of buying things new off the shelf at the local hardware for $100, the same thing I was finding at the tip and I would, I would spend a dollar on it. So I had this time to salvage. I had this time to grow food. I had this time to walk for uh, forage and to, to start hunting and trapping animals. Um, so I was like full time in the home economy and Meg was still servicing um, our very modest uh, mortgage um, 
because we you know we live in regional australia and back then 20 years ago it was you know mortgages were still pretty modest for low income people and so yeah the 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 two the car like people do it all differently this is just our story but going in the first two years from two cars to no cars and bike riding and walking everywhere and hitching because you know we're we're well known in our community so hitching is great and then we have a yarn and share a story with whoever picked us up and and then you know we started to realize well this is a gift they're actually spending money on maintaining their car and their petrol um what gifts can we have so we started traveling with homegrown foods and preserves and ferments and stuff like that so we always had a gift of exchange and um and we also had things we could lend out as well so it yeah we found that really powerful going car free was just took so much economic pressure off us the average car in australia is around fifteen thousand dollars a year for usage that is depreciation wear and tear maintenance oil petrol insurance licenses all, all everything factored in it's fifteen thousand, and the average australian household has two and a half cars so we're talking like around forty thousand dollars a year the average household in australia has to find just for the privilege of car use well by arresting that that our our cars were, were bombs so it was more like twelve thousand dollars a year we didn't have to find um but i wasn't out as a builder having all my tools go backwards and my ute needing servicing and um and also the time i was getting paid by the time clients actually paid me i was like you know i'd spent it all um so i was just constantly from behind so here i was in a much better mental state i was determined to make this work because i wanted to stay at home i didn't want to be in that um in monetary economy my partner meg um scaled down from full-time work to two or three days a week work and and then the rest of the time in the monetary, uh, sorry, in the household and community economies. And then we had this time to make not just food for ourselves, but actually food in terms of gifts. And then we started, you know, bringing stuff to our neighbours. Um, when new neighbours would come and we'd take a big basket of produce. And that immediately created this social bond. And then things started flowing back to us. Um, and what we found is the generosity, we had time to be generous and the generosity started flowing back and it we didn't you know we we didn't set that up as expectation it's like we always say to people with gifts if you have no capacity to give please don't feel guilty i think a lot of people in the monetary economy it's like oh it's tit for tat all the time and so crafting an economy that's based on a flow of gifts it's only give when there is abundance only give when you have capacity to give don't give away your stores you know like your body and your family's bodies first nourish them first so as you have the capacity to be in service to your community so um yeah like and i think that our sort of gallant but you know naive um approach to arresting the uh in your in our face um i guess global capitalism uh arresting that uh in our lives was, has been incredibly liberating and every year step by step taking more and more away and you know all our clothes come from the local thrift store or the uh, op shops um they get handed down to us and we hand on clothes and uh, we mend our clothes um we don't we make clothes also with the skins and and with the wool um we've now got sheep and goats not because we have any land but slowly bit by bit there was land around us that needed bushfire mitigating and there was a lot of weeds there so just slowly bit by bit our neighbors have given us about 30 neighbors have given us the social license to run our goats and sheep through this bit of um, unmanaged land which then reduces the weed load and therefore the fire risk load in in our neighborhood which has brought because we've got time to do that it means that we've we're effectively farming without a mortgage 
and that we run between 10 animals when um, up to about uh, 18 animals, depending on the time of the year. And it means that we have nutritious meat that comes about um, by eating some of the world's most nutritious weed species. And so goat meat is highly nutritious because they browse widely. They get this pharmacopoeia of medicinal plants like blackberry and dandelion and um, you know mallow and hawksbeard and thistles and all of these incredibly um, medicinally charged and loaded um, plants. So yeah, like that's this is 20 years on, but we we started with like how do we get rid of a bin liner? in our house mm -hmm. well we set up a worm farm and then then we got chooks and then we you know then we got bees and you know so we've closed the loops in so many different what we used to call resources now we call relationships and i think changing our um slowly bit by bit changing our the way in which we see food and energy and medicine as resource which is a very extractive word to actually there are a set of relationships what the relationship we have with the forest what gifts can we give back to the forest because we're taking our firewood which is powering our house um what can we take back will we sift the wood ash um the potash from the charcoal we crush the charcoal and um pound it with a with a um crowbar and then we tip in our household urine into the charcoal and it activates, it puts a high nitrogen contact uh, um, com composite into the charcoal, which then means when the charcoal goes into the garden or the back to the forest, it's loaded with nitrogen and it doesn't steal nitrogen from plants around it. It goes in already pre-packed. And so this is like one way we can give back. And then with the potash that we've sifted, that is a, a wonderful um, potassium is a wonderful thing to grow woody um, woody biomes. So our food forest, part of the garden, or the forest, the actual forest where we get the wood from. So all of these like hundreds and hundreds of little things that have accrued over time, just because we kept leaning in, knowing what we want to leave behind, turning it into a life practice rather than just something we do on the weekends, which would have been demoralizing, just knowing that we needed to fully switch. Um, sustainability on the weekends is a good place to start, and I get that. And also things like arming ourselves with one of the earliest things we did when we were still in uh, consuming supermarket food. Uh, I think in your country, um, I think from the States comes uh, two lists that were really important that we had in our wallets, the Dirty Dozen, and the clean mm. fifteen, the the clean fifteen, and so if you're still, if you're just starting out, that's a really good place to start. Avoid the dirty dozen, which includes you know conventional apples and berries like blueberries and things. They have the most amount of pesticides in them, and then the conventional agriculture products like the clean fifteen that hardly need any uh, pesticides, like alliums, for example, onions and leeks, because unless they're coming into Australia and then everything gets bromided and, you know, um, but yeah, if they're in, in your country, um, those things need very little, if not any, like avocados, bananas, things like that. Um, although bananas still have some pesticides, but um, yeah, yeah. For, for people just new to this, um, the clean 15 and the dirty dozen is a really great way to start your consciousness around what is really the worst foods in conventional agriculture and what are the better foods to eat because not everyone can afford organic food um but then the next best thing is you, you well not the next best thing the next tier out is your farmer's market and becoming part of community supported agriculture um if you're not ready or you don't have the time to buy your own but again that's kind of exy but if you're looking at the dirty dozen um, in a supermarket and saying, right, I'm not going to buy those. So they're the ones I will buy at the local farmer's market um, that are organically grown or, or whatever. But ultimately, I think if we're going to, for everyone, for this to be accessible across the economic spectrum, 
um, becoming sub a, a subsistence economy first is really going to improve your health, improve your physicality, um, and also your mental and, and physiological state by just the nutrition. Yeah, and you mentioned some great points, especially um, one thing that I always found interesting, and I'm sure this is in Australia as well, is how great U.S. propaganda has been at getting Americans to value what's not important as most important and what's most important is least important. So like they're, of course, everyone probably says, yeah, your mental and physical health and community is important. But then you look at their actions and it's like an invisible second or like a hundredth place in their in their daily activities. And with the finances, I mean, like not even including the car. And that's a great quote you mentioned about the car. Like the average American is spending eight to sixteen thousand dollars a year on non-essential expenses like alcohol, eating out, subscription services, that new iPhone, although who needs that damn new model if the old model has already been working, uh, all that stuff. And then um, I know you mentioned a few times not, not everyone can afford organic. And of course, there are various levels of integrity of organic, like USDA organic is, is not that great of a label as it used to be back in the day and stuff of that sort. But generally speaking, I mean, the average um, for about like 2000 calories a day of U at least USDA organic certified produce, which is a great start. It's not the end of a journey, but it's a great start. I mean, you're looking at about like $12 and 70 cents a day, you know, in a factory farm version of those 2000 calories, about seven, seven dollars and 50 cents. So yeah. there is a $5 difference, but then the average American is also buying a $5 cup of coffee at Starbucks every morning, you know? <laughs> And no problem, like no problem figuring out how to get that money without any uh, protests or contests or anything. Yeah, yeah, it's such a good point. Yeah, it's how we prioritize um, what's really important. And because, yeah, and, and you started this um, section with propaganda. I think, you know, re realizing just how incredibly sophisticated the advertising industry is in and has been for, you know, a, at least a century, um, but increasingly so, you know, like nudge units or, or behavioral scientists being, you know, working closely with industry to make sure we are nudged closer and closer um, to, you know, and even just how social media and, and the big techs work in terms of like manipulating um, our lives all the time. So, like I think a big part of it for us was just tuning out of the corporate media, tuning out of us, you know, big tech media, and really just going from independent websites um, where we're not like, um, yeah, like building a a big media um, ecology. I think is is just more and more important, and we will have. Um, you know, across the political spectrum, we have this huge range of people we listen to or get our information for. And um, most people, we don't believe in everything that's, or not believe, but we don't go along with everything. It's just having a, a, a diverse compost of medias is so important in making the behavioral changes. And usually, while YouTube has been a great resource um, because there's so, so many free how-to videos um, and we've got a, a YouTube channel called Artists' as Family and we've put up a whole range of different stuff over the years um, from, you know, quite sort of, uh, you know, political-minded stuff around permaculture and, and, and then just really pragmatic stuff like, how to ferment some chokes and um and everything in between um but yeah we we like i mean we're big sub stack people we 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 cross reference a huge amount of um doctors and uh, nutritionists across sub stack um but we make it up ourselves too like i mean like that's just it's not to i think you know this all this sort of hype about about all the the misinformation industry that is forming it's another industrial industry really that's forming to make sure that people are shepherded away from alternative views like 
the way in which heterodox views or dissenting views in health or medicine or food or, um, you know, like it's 20, 30 years ago, um, the, the green left, which is my political homeland um, back then as a young man, was like, you know, fighting against the rise of GMOs and saying there is a big warning bell here, but it's also a corporate takeover of, of a food commons. And we're big fans of Vandana Shiva for this because she's been really trying to raise awareness in that space for many, many, uh, many, many decades. Um, but all of a sudden, we've seen this sort of the green left has almost become um, well something entirely different. And so we've been watching that that slip um, where you know, I mean, the way in which we saw the medicines that were available, the treatments that were available in COVID, we um, we looked at what they were and it was like, it was really clear that they were GMO medicines. And yet- Not to interrupt you, Patrick, but watch now, the misinformation label is gonna come on on our- Oh no. Our, yeah, was, it's okay, go ahead, speak course. your mind up. Uh, that, yeah. that whole circus of four years was just ridiculous. It still continues to this day. Yeah, well, you know, feel free to cut it out if it's going to... No, 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 it's going to be on here. I mean, the, the thing about that is that the the in Australia, the government, the federal government's office of gene regulation, whether where anything that's gene um, engineered comes to that office to be regulated by government, they have for the last three years stated that the two mRNA vaccines that came into Australia were GMOs. They're examples of GMOs. And so, and yet um, there are other departments in Australia that were saying they weren't. So there was this incredible conflict. Um, and so, you know, it's so bizarre that you can have a government department clearly stating that. And we we have those screen grabs and uh, on our website on various posts, um, and yet, if you say that, you know, you're a conspiracy theory theorist. It's it's like this bizarre twist of reality that I'm I'm still trying to fathom. But anyway, I, I think the the least that's not where it's at for us. Like I think that the COVID moment, the exaggeration of an illness in the face of something like obesity and diabetes, mm -hmm. where it's 18 million people die every year with chronic heart attack, with smoking and toxic food. Um, and so, you know, so much more. It's like a global health pandemic of food and tobacco and alcohol. And yet there is no kind of big response. And yet we have this flu that's a bit more fluy than most years. Um, and, you know, it, it, it obviously um, affected people. Um, yeah, people that are already like massively medically drugged out and sick already. It, exactly, who are already vulnerable. Um, but then this turning the lens onto those of us who are not, who are healthy and had the social responsibility to to basically build immunity naturally and then therefore build herd immunity. Just the way in which herd immunity, our immune systems, which are millions of years old in the development, were overnight completely irrelevant and that we must follow big pharma and I, I, it's just extraordinary um the power of propaganda and the, the nudge units that that deceive so many people and so many people are sick now there is mm -hmm. the ndis the national disability scheme in australia many of my friends are like workers um i've never like just in the last three or four years, there is now this enormous industry of carers um, getting paid very well. I mean, most of my friends are artists, so they're no normally working in hospitality and getting paid very poorly. But, you know, many of them are getting $40, $50 an hour to take out people with disabilities to get their shopping and their basic needs or take them to the doctor or, you know, look after them. And, you know, while that many of my friends say it's a really beautiful job because they you know they're helping people and that that's a beautiful story like who is actually looking into this escalation of illness 
Um, and where does it derive? Well, I don't think anyone in the uh, formal institutions of our country want to really examine that at all. And so I think, I guess I'm saying all this not to get caught up in the polemic of the COVID moment. I, I really, um, but but more so to, to say we can no longer trust our, the medical system. In Australia, I don't know if it's the same in the States, but our doctors get paid every treatment they prescribe. They get a tip. It, 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 they're essentially... Um, yeah, there's a, it, there, there is pharma a pharma reps of the year. Yeah, that's right. They're pharma reps. And it, th there is a problem in medicine when that is happening. There is the easy of good people, of, of good doctors, but over the years going, oh, I can just, you know, even without knowing it, the slip from writing a prescription of what someone needs to like, oh, I could just massage this. And, you know, it would happen without the way the human mind works. It would happen so easily and then just become systemic corruption where you just like, no, every script, you know, that's my next trip, my next family's trip to, uh, you know, skiing in the Alps or something like that. Um, you know, that, that kind of form of medicine is never going to be good for people where, you know, we're even getting friends um, whose doctors are ringing them up and saying, hey, I um, can see you haven't been in for a while. Uh, I think you should come in for a checkup. It's like, what? Where, when did this happen? So it, I think just the aggressive, the way in which a, a local general practice, when I grew up, I had a doctor who would say, when I was a boy, uh, to my mom, this, this, this kid needs three days in bed and give him some honey water and lemon and he needs rest and it's like we don't have that anymore <laughs> well, partly because of the pressure of modern life get to school get to work mm -hmm. um so there, there, there's that feeding into it um but like when when does a doctor in 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 our countries prescribe three days of rest with honey water and lemon you know it, it that's just like old woo woo um and yet this is how I got better. Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning into the podcast. I'm curious, have you ever been confused by the labels in the grocery store? In Yevgeny's book, he demystifies the difference between caged, cage-free, free-range, and pasture-raised meats. He also covers how to avoid GMOs, source high-quality water, fish, supplements, and other related topics. It's a beautifully illustrated, non-technical read that comes with a comprehensive video series and other extended learning materials. Jump on Amazon and check out the book titled Anti-Factory Farm Shopping Guide by Evgeny Trefkin. Now let's dive back into the podcast. I always say like sick people can't make healthy decisions or they wouldn't be sick themselves. And I don't know, like, of course there are no absolutes and there are very few doctors that are doing far better than I am. But pretty much like 99% are a complete mess themselves, overworked, overstressed, yeah. probably uh, like drinking more than they should be or on a whole bunch of pharmaceutical drugs themselves or recreational drugs, um, totally misaligned with their core values, probably got into the occupation for all the wrong reasons, but now stuck because of the massive student debt and just the cost of running a practice, et cetera, et cetera. And um, yeah, I mean... It's, it's a mess. Like personally, I try to avoid the doctors. I have health insurance still for sure. Uh, but I try to, I, I haven't been to the doctors in probably like 12, 15 years because I'm just like afraid to go. And then on top of that, now being around people like Paula Check and like Stuart McGill and great actual healers, I'm like, dude, there's just so much better shit than taking all these toxic medical drugs that yeah. don't cure or prevent anything. And then on top of that, like literally 99.9 .9 of the percent of the time is just used as a crutch for a person to keep being the dummy that they were that led them into health issue ABC. And even if that health issue is solved through that drug because of some lottery winning, which never happens, the problem is, is if you never change the belief system that led to that health problem, it's going to just lead to a myriad of other mental and physical health problems throughout the person's life. So it's like, uh, it's such a stupid system, but it's great yeah. at making money. But it's like, it's, 
I mean, you have to be like such low IQ to not see the idiocy of that kind of healthcare model, because it's just yet, like it's, yet that what you started with was a very compassionate view, particularly with doctors that you know whether they got good grades at school or whether they had a you know real intention to heal and help people, which I think most doctors begin uh, in that realm. The system itself, the institution in um, public health. Um, you know, it puts them on an unstoppable path to uh, to, to participate in a in what has become a systemically corrupt, but gradually, step by step, sort of unnoticeably, year by year, corrupt path. So um, I think, yeah, I mean, I think to, the compassion is the biggest thing in this. Like, no, no one wants to be uh, to hear a story that is like, ah, oh, you know, I've got it all together. I, you know, I've got my health together. I'm you know, people want to hear how it happened. And um, I think that, it, I think it just keeps coming back to um, behavioral change, like uh, taking responsibility for our lives, because if we don't, we're going to end up sick. I, it's not lo no longer like, oh, well, if we don't take responsibility for our life, at least there's still good food and potatoes and meat and veg. And, you know, because our whole agriculture system is, honoring of the earth and you know um but it, these things all come together they all um particularly in this day and age where where predatorial capitalism as opposed to the local market capitalism where you know the growers and you know the the met, the, the herbalists and you know where we came from only recently only in yeah in a blimp of time most of human history People have worked together to look after it themselves, to have to go to the shaman, to you know learn to hunt by the elders, uh, initiation rites of passage into basically making sure that the village is well or the the tribe is well because that I mean I'm, I'm not glossing over things. Of course, there's many different expressions of of our indigenous and peasant past, and not all of them are, are like a, a glowing story at all. But in terms of where we are now, where we are isolated from one another, there is no code interdependency. Um, and there is no kind of understanding that my well-being and health is dependent on my neighborhood and my family and everybody in the tribe or the village. And so rebuilding the village while we're rebuilding our health and taking back control from what has been extracted generation after generation so that our kids are born into this system they don't know any different and that, and that's why i think just to go back to an earlier point understanding what we've what land bonded villages we used to be part of and they weren't perfect but but that there was you know, like a, and you know, every time, particularly in America, when when I'm talking about the problems of capitalism, people all, all automatically say you're a communist. It's like, no, that's so problematic as well. There is, it, it's not, we don't have the choices between capitalism or predatorial capitalism and communism, authoritarian co communism. There is something quite other that we've come from. That is the combination that, in, like, uh, I guess, um, yeah, where, where individuals, the individual is important and the community is important. And how the individual fits into the community is by each of us bringing our own gifts and so that we all have a role. So that would be the capitalist part of our DNA, of our cultural DNA or economic DNA. Yes, we need to like be seen and witness for our gifts, and um, and so if you know the, and then the other side of things is like how do those gifts integrate into the village to make the whole village sing, and I think that that um, so this is not just about reclamation of food, medicine, and energy resources. This is reclamation of uh, a much more holistic um, sense of well-being, and that's why the men's and women's circles and the bush school and also meg and i are involved in the rites of passage movement here where we you know are really um creating events challenges and ceremony uh so that young 
young men and women are seen, uh, are actually seen by their community. And they, if the, the best way of seeing um, the community witnessing the gifts of each teenager is for that teenager to be removed from uh, the, the family unit, to go off into a, a group with other teenagers, their, their peers, and to go with trusted mentors and elders into um, what we call mother country or um, a non-human space into the into the forest and um, to go through a series of challenges and thresholds uh, which are not demoralizing that are still uh, you know have a safety net around them and yet they're also um, setting up situations where each teenager not in a comp highly competitive way but in a way in which each teenager can um, rise to a challenge and then through that be the, the mentors and elders on that um, on that in that event really quickly recognize those gifts reflect them back but also the young person is finding out who they are and I think without these sorts of processes, we are very vulnerable to being propagandized and influenced by nudge units and advertisers and big corporate interests. I feel like knowing who we are and building that self-integrity and self-respect is the kind of first step into, um, yeah, on this road of reclamation, whatever it is we're rec reclaiming. I mean, for us, it's land bondedness and community and village. How do we recreate out of the ruins and apocalypse, really, of this industrial culture where it's falling apart, this global industrial culture? How in those ruins, how can we, uh, because apocalypse, I don't mean in like in the Hollywood sense. I mean, in, in the old sense that something is dying and in that something is renewing. And I feel like our renewal in um, the destruction or the self-destruction of the global machine that is, I guess, the industrial moment, the capitalist industrial moment uh, of our species. Um, and how do we go from greed is good to earth honoring is good and whatever happens from there. So rather than the bankers determining the cultural story, how do we move to a mythos? That is, whatever happens, we need to start with the earth is sacred. The mother, whether it be Gaia, whether it be mother country or mother earth, the earth is sacred and everything that takes place in our community trickles down from there. That's that's really it. Like there is a, a part you know, we have to avoid, I think we have to avoid ideology, but we also have to recognize that the the dominant ideology is what the bankers realm or the, you know, the, you know, the, the, the world's richest. Um, but I think the banks really determine what the, the cultural dominant mythos is. And if we can see and understand that or even test that theory, maybe I'm wrong, um, but if we do arrive at, yes, it is actually the dominant story is causing everything as a trickle down effect. How do we move to earth honoring as the dominant ideology? But then after that, no people and their communities need to be able to um, renew from there. And people will say, oh, yeah, but we need our military and we need we need to keep um, pro producing bombs and, and you know, high tech meds and we need to keep finding enemies and or you know protecting ourselves from enemies because we've brought the propaganda of um of of the politicians that we have you know that the whole wo wo world is is a war and we we've got to keep defending ourselves um but by extricating ourselves from dependency on that war machine on the industrial monetary or and, and industrial military complexes um, and industrial pharma complexes and industrial food complexes and energy complexes and education complexes. We can, um, and big tech complexes, we, we can uh, disempower those systems and 
step by step, household by household, individual by individual, and aggregate. And, and it'll, it'll be necessary anyway. And those of us who begin this process earlier, while there's still a relative amount of wealth and non-panic around, uh, are going to be better equipped because it takes time. It's taken us 20 years to get to this just 20% reliance mm -hmm. of, on the monetary economy. So those who are starting to put these things into place bit by bit um, are going to be so much better off and, and avoid the, the utter chaos of the panic as things fully collapse around, around people. And if you're embedded in the industrial uh, global economy and all of its um, toxicities, then um, you're going to be vulnerable. I th there's no doubt about it. And it's not to say that those of us who are transitioning away from that are going to be any less valuable, vulnerable. I mean, you know, there could be chaos and people get shot and there could be any sort of world event. Um, but you're going to ex aggregate your chances of not just survival, but actually renewal and start to build the kinds of communities that um, will be much more resilient through deep listening and compassion, as well as good food and medicine. I think, I think all of these things are in the mix. Yeah, I always thought, I mean, I have, I have a few questions here for you, but I always thought of uh, that as like one of the short, um, like, for example, like, oh, I don't need a gun if the other person doesn't have a gun, but the other person already has a gun, you know what I mean? Kind of thing in terms of the military situation, um, stuff like that. And you kind of mentioned uh, one thing about, I'm rewinding back quite a bit, but one thing about like COVID and people all of a sudden being so worried about their health. I found that totally funny, like you as well. It's like most people are just very obese and very sick. And now all of a sudden they're so worried about their health. And I'm like, dude, you're going to totally die anyways, like a premature death. And in the meantime, you're not going to live a very high quality life anyways. But now all of a sudden you're in panic and getting this one shot is going to all of a sudden help you, which just shows how desperately dependent people are on symptom management and how desperate they are to do anything possible but change the person that's causing their misery, obesity, and disease. So it's kind of like, I guess you can say the industry is matching the need of the population, you know? The population doesn't want to change, so the industry matches them with symptom management, and then also um, kind of, you can say, like brainwashes them into believing that is the right path to continue on. And like, I, I was in the forest for eight months when COVID first started, and I was documenting the thing and I wasn't even telling people to not get the vaccine. It was up to them. I was just saying I wasn't going to get them. And here's what I was doing, working out in the morning, you know, uh, fishing during the day, had a steam room too, which was really cool or a sauna rather. And people were like attacking me left and right. People are like, like super obese and super unhealthy. I'm like, dude, come on, man, <laughs> just get a grip for a second, you know, and it just shows you how like normalized mental and physical illness um, yeah. in our culture. Yeah. We were we were called ableists. Um, and, you know, like that's another thing. When I was a builder and when Meg and I were both wholly dependent on the on the big economy and, and this, therefore the sickness economy and the industrial food economy that, that feeds that sickness, um, we we were sick, and but we were still young. If I had continued on that way, I would have all sorts of illnesses now. As, as a 53 year old, I have no illnesses. I feel amazing. I feel like as strong and my endurance is like as, as strong as it is when I was 22. And that's because of decisions I've made. That's because of st steering clear of um, the, the health system and the industrial food system. So, you know, to, to be labeled ableists um, because we saw it as our responsibility to get this thing uh, that was probably souped up in a lab, you know, to, so, you know, we did some things that um, to strengthen our immune system even more, but cold water plunging is our flu shot. Um, it's, you know, our, our good food is our, our flu shot. You know, these, these things, you know, this, this fabrication that we can only exist through industrialized medicine is, is, you know, 
a fast and rapid propaganda of the last 20 years and um, just unfolding. And it's just advertising and, you know, the, changing the perception of, for, of those who are not seeing the slide the slippery slope uh, of this agenda. Um, so yeah, like, you know, to be people, we are real involved, really involved in our community. We've been in service to our community in many different ways. Um, and our bush school is volunteer and our men's and women's circles that we all, we do this as volunteers because we've got the time now to, to give back. We've got our, household in in um a good place so that we can offer these things um so that people of all income streams can can come along to this we were called like right wing selfish granny killing ableists and it was it was uh, unbelievable this wasn't coming from just government although government were giving permission to be discriminatory against people like us but uh it it, it, it was like, wow, wow, that's how deep this propaganda has gone. That, you know, colleagues, friends, former former friends are calling us um, ableists, whereas actually we, we're people who took responsibility for our health and that's somehow a right-wing thing now. It's extraordinary. Like, um, and, and yet, you know, I come from a green left movement that 20 years ago was like, Corporate and government collusion is a problem. We need to watch this. And the, it was the, the green left that was like pointing the finger at this corruption of power. That group pretty much got on the back of Globo Corp or Gov, Gov Corp um, ideology and just fanned uh, this belief that this is the only, that Pfizer was was the most, um, you know, responsible, well-meaning, you know, silver bullet that we possibly had. It, it was an extraordinary mindfuck for us uh, to to see this slip, and 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 you know, then looking into that, why is that? And then looking at the Guardian newspaper, which was set up to be independent, it had a trust so that corruption wouldn't happen through advertisers and then seeing that about 12 years ago bill gates started giving money to the guardian and over the last um decade has given like over 12 million us to the guardian which doesn't sound like a lot but it's not a huge paper um it's actually a lot it's this what we noticed that with the bill and melinda gates foundation is this trickle feeding into media particularly left and progressive medias over the last um decade and um, and also um, into science departments, this trickle feeding into university departments by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So, so it's not like you can't sort of say, oh, that's a lot of money, you know, one million here and one million there. But it's just across the world, across media and academic institutions, just trickle feeding with the promise of, oh, and you know what what. Um, Bill Gates set up for the Guardian is the global is a kind of um, global development site of the Guardian, with a particular emphasis on how you message global health outcomes. It's like, well, there's you know, like, and and of course the statement on the Guardian is that this money is you know ha has no strings attached and blah blah blah. But if, if that is, if people believe that, I think they're very naive. So. You know, like COVID was a time of doing all this really unnecessary work. Um, but because of the absence of journalism, particularly in the corporate media, um, we felt as citizen journalists, we had to actually just say, well, look, this website, government website says this. This this is happening here in The Guardian, where, you know, those on the left are trusting this media. And, and looking at the BBC, looking at the Australian Broadcasting Commission, which is the government directed um which has been you know a wonderful institution in australia for for decades um and just seeing it slide into being basically a government mouthpiece a propaganda mouthpiece it was unbelievably atrocious in covid so yeah these these trusted institutions how they led so many people uh down this slippery path of basically 
pointing the finger at people like us to such a degree that we feared that at, at one point in late 2021 that we would be interned and force vaccinated. That's what we were, this, we were mm -hmm. this from that in this country. So, um, yeah, we, we... I mean, it was we, the same here. It was kind of headed in that direction yeah. uh, as well, which is kind of, which I thought was like kind of ridiculous because I'm like, dude, now it's like, I'm all about like, you know, I do what you want. But then when it starts affecting me, that's like a different story, you know? And it was just ridiculous that like people that have literally lived a life of obesity, misery, and disease, like wanted this pushed on everyone else. You know what I mean? I'm like, dude, you have literally no clue of how to even control yourself, even on the most fundamental aspects of your life, you know what I mean? Or anything about health and wellness. And then they kind of, like you said, look at us, like we're the weirdos or kind of extremists. I'm like, dude, being obese, like sitting in front of a computer all day, like hating your life, being on a bunch of medical drugs, that is what extreme mental and physical illness is. Not like living in the forest and freaking not being super materialistic and depleting the world resources and just uh, maybe using materialism just to match your biological needs, but not nothing further than that, you know? Like yeah. that's not extreme. That is what normal is, you know, materialism, yeah. obesity, misery, medical drug dependence, needing to take like a bottle of Xanax and have a 10 cups of coffee in the morning just to have enough energy to wa wash your dishes and et cetera. That is what extreme mental illness is. Yeah. It's like so stupid that that's become normal. You know, that is what 90% of people are living. That's why maybe people like you and I are viewed like weirdos. Yeah, certainly. <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah, it's extraordinary just how capable the propaganda or how, as I said, how sophisticated the propaganda is to, to, um, yeah, to, to make normal what is actually extreme and then to point at common sense approaches or um, self care and community care approaches as being actually extreme and somehow caught up in conspiracy and disinformation or misinformation and i i think that you know that the we like your country and many of the five i uh, nations the the anglo sphere i suppose um th there is this incredible um uh you know subservience to to the misinformation industry that's burgeoning um, there is like this, people believe that there is a problem, a real deep problem with misinformation and conspiracy theorists, like somehow that's where the power is. And yet they're not looking at where real power is coming from, the corporate government collusion that, you know, and, you know, the bankers are right at the top of that. That's where the real power is. How has particularly progressives and people on the left, people from my political homeland, how have somehow we have been hoodwinked into believing that marginal voices or dissenting voices or heterodox thinkers or, you know, crazy folk who are, you know, like the Unabomber, you know, and that kind of caliber of thinker, um, you know, like right out there, uh, uh, but you know, once tolerated, kind of, because some of the some of the craziest folk can bring gifts into a community. Um, whereas this sort of monoculture of the mind approach, where oh yes, you know, I, we 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 believe governments are right. We we need to crack down on misinformation because they're so powerful and in influencing people's lives. While we're not looking at the lies that were promulgated, as particularly over COVID, but but. But it, just about everything that's big, that's uh, you know whether it be some war or whether it be some big thing that industry is going to make a lot of money from, we're not saying actually that's the power we need to critique. That is the power, you know. Some marginal voices, you know, that have a Substack page or a YouTube channel are not powerful. They may influence some people. They, you know. You, your your channel may you know keep growing in numbers, and our, our our weird little site in the in the interwebs may you know influence people. It may not, um, but that's not real power. 
Real power is what is coming through the corporate and government collusion through places like the, the World Health Organization, the World Economic Forum, um, and of course the silent power that we don't see through the banker's realm and and those big families and those big dudes that we we don't even know their names because they need to be completely out of the the picture. So um yeah those that power needs to be to be critiqued and we need to stop beating up uh, heterodox thinkers and um you know if, if we don't have a healthy heterodox in a society the orthodox becomes crazy it becomes monological if there is no little little heterodox over here you know in academia in newspapers or you know in media in any aspect of life in institutions if there isn't the acceptance from the orthodox that the heterodox actually operates as a trickster as a as a hey what about this maybe we could read it like this what is happening at the moment is the heterodox is being smashed in the academies in the in the newspapers there is no ability to say hey what about this it's like no that's a conspiracy that's misinformation it's 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 mind-boggling but this is the path to how i'm reading it the path to totalitarianism however i think the COVID moment really awoke woke a lot of people in terms of just how bad things have got and even though many people haven't accepted that they were hoodwinked or that they the propaganda got them captured them gained them um i think deep down in people's psyches they do feel that oh shit you know sometime i'm gonna have to look into that shadow because i was fully gamed and i won't be gamed again and so i think there is more uh distributed awareness and and why free speech is being cracked down on like why governments and corporations are working hand in hand um particularly media big big tech media corporations are you know it it's it looks like this sort of um it looks like this sort of uh adversarial relationship between government and big big tech but i i think there's a lot more collusion and a lot more sort of sympathetic stuff it's got to look like it's adversarial just to look like there's some sort of democracy going on but like all of this is interesting politically but if we i find that if we just think in terms of politics and we we then get caught up in the old story um and the the toxic story and i think that if 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 we don't have a new story to create and put most of our energy into that then we're just going to get caught up in reductive politics and i think that the the most liberating thing for people is to be walking and talking and renewing our cultural ways whether that be through art or media or storytelling like this um podcast um while putting back all the pieces of our health um because I, you know as a, as a sort of more cerebrally defo my default thing is head but if i you know, I've, I've really made a practice of connecting to my heart and my gut as two logic centers that are in need to be thinking for me as well as my rational logic center and so um i i like to talk about through my three brains my heart brain my gut brain and my my mind brain and of course that there's two parts to that as well and it's more complicated than that but yeah this integration of body and earth and earth honoring and reculturing and telling the new story of how we are to become a ceremonial species again how do we become a, a species of gratitude and and i think ritual and ceremony is a really excellent way so when we talk about our food what what food on our plate before we eat a meal do we know any of the origin stories of our food you know yeah um our neighbor 
um, brought the the spinach over. And uh, another fella at the the local market um, has grown that that beef, and we've grown these onions. You know, like uh, start to retell the story of our resources, um, and do that with our children because I think that. Um, yeah, for some people listening and their children are already along the path and being indoctrinated by industrial schooling and, you know, industrial culture generally, it's it's going to be difficult, but still bringing them the possibility of change. But if you've got little kids to start to build ritual around food, even if it's food that comes from the supermarket, it's like honoring the anonymous pig or honoring the anonymous um, avocado. You know, like someone grew this. How amazing. Let's honor the farmer. Let's honor the rainfall. Let's honor the sunlight. Isn't it amazing that this earth that we have has this just hot enough, not too hot, not too cold power system that enables all this life to take place? And and to move from reductive politics and sort of feeling demoralized by this greed system. Um, to like, well, actually, what is really powerful is sunlight, is rainfall, is soil, is earth, and our participation as eco ecological participants in the making of, of life, that is powerful. And all of a sudden, we can start to say, bankers, back off, start to plan our way out of debt, um, if we're in debt, and if we're not in debt, don't get into debt. Um, don't be beholden to these toxic systems of power. Let's be beholden to real systems of power like, like the sun and, and the cycles of weather and the seasonality. Um, and let's, let's recreate these ecological modes for culture making. Yeah, I had a wanted to. I had something to say about uh, that as well, but I kind of was listening to you and was trying to be attentive to what you're saying and spaced out on on what I wanted to ask and, and didn't write it down. But I, I, this is a slight parallel shift or a perpendicular shift in the conversation here. Uh, but Patrick, I was wondering, kind of like just for some practical questions, um, like what's going to happen, for example, uh, like if you break your leg. Like if something extreme like that, like what's what's your strategy there with your current system? That's a great question. Because yeah, I, I note also before you you talking about the problem of absolutes. And I don't like while I'm I'm being quite strong with and clear about my values and what I believe in, I'm not an absolutist. I'm I want to be flexible. I want to integrate the dominant culture with this new culture making. So we don't go to any Western you know, uh, public health center or doctor anymore. But if there's an emergency, like a few years back, I put a chainsaw in my leg. Um, and, you know, I was just so grateful for the nurses and the doctors and they stitched me back up and I recovered well. I think emergency is, Western medicine is awesome for emergency. And so wonderful. That's great. Just don't treat it for prevention or, you know, <laughs> you know, other things. That's that's how that's how um where we've arrived. So yeah, it's not like setting ourselves up for failure and saying, um, you know, we won't be we we totally refuse those systems. However, we grow a lot of comfrey in our garden and comfrey has we've had sprains and fractures in our hands where we haven't gone to the to the doctor or emergency and we've just um, done poultices of comfrey it's called knit bone in our ancestral language and it's incredibly powerful herb for uh, healing of fractures and and um, sprains and bruised and um, you know healing the body so yeah so while it's wonderful to have this sort of uh, emergency um, system uh, in, the, in the dominant culture. We're also saying, well, what happens if we do this? If it's a really bad break, yes, let's go and get it set in plaster. But if it's a sprain or a small fracture, 
we know what to do. It's the same with suturing. We've got um, nurse, a nurse friend who has been collecting all the, th the suture kits from her hospital that are to be thrown out just because they have some arbitrary use by date, but they're all packed away in sterilized packs. She's been collecting those for our community use and teaching us how to suture in our homes. Um, so I think it's a combination. It's like being absolute and saying never again to that. Um, we don't have any insurance. We, we about, I don't know, a year ago, we decided, right, that's it. We have, if the house burns down, I've got building skills where we have loved community. We will rebuild a tiny house and we, we will get back in and we will, with, with materials from the tip and from local tip, um, builder skips and also from the gift economy, people will drop off doors and windows and, and within a week I'll have a little building done and we'll start again. And so rather than say we're going to pay $2,000 a year in the event that our house burns down, we're, we're, we're saying, well, actually, um, the social bonds that we have and also the expertise and the skills that we've built means that, and also they're the like, okay, life throws suffering and pain at us. It's like, that's an opportunity for growth. And so I think that, yeah, the more we've moved away from dependency on big systems, the more courage we have, the more we can give away. And each year we try to, to, to check off one more thing or a few more big structural things. Well, how about, um, Patrick, you know, how much more time do I have of yours? I don't want to take up too much time. I just have a few more practical questions. Yeah. Um, can we maybe pause this? Because I, I really just need to have a bio break. Yeah. Um, come back in a minute. Yep. Or I mean, can keep it running. Great. All right. So, Patrick, just uh, another like one or two quick practical questions. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of people think about this when planning their future. But what's going to happen when you get into like really old age and you're really and you're ready to kind of leave this external world? Yeah, well, again, it's um, where we are in the village. So um, Meg and I have done a lot of elevating of elders in our in our community and really recognizing as younger middle-aged people, um, you know, who the elders are um, over the last 10 years. And, you know, just uh, at, at, at gatherings and potluck dinners and things like that, um just saying yeah could the could the elders go first uh, to the table and um and then uh inviting elders to do an honoring of the food and just um really seeing ourselves as 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 younger people who we look up to um elders who haven't claimed eldership i think a lot of olders or older people um claim eldership like you should respect me because i of my age it's like well actually these are elders these are people who are quietly working in the community to make people's lives more rich and so i feel like um there's things younger people can do to raise the status of such people in our communities to look out and to you know in, when we have gatherings there from little babies to little kids, to teenagers, right up to 70, 80, 90 year olds sometimes. So it's a, you know, and this, another thing is like in an industrial culture sense, you're often, well, I was often just mixing with my own peer group. Whereas rebuilding the village is actually this beautiful interrelationship um, with, with all age groups. And so the, um, yeah, we have built tiny houses here. We uh, have volunteers, students here what we, at what we call the School of Applied Neo-Peasantry, uh, where people come and learn in a volunteer sense. So they they labor with us. So we get added help, but it's also a learning opportunity. It's a schooling uh, in how to reclaim some of these skills and practical situations. But we've got three external buildings here where there's 
people of different age groups staying, sometimes visitors for short times, sometimes people living with us, also just trying to arrest that nuclear family isolation or rarefication um, and bringing the cultural other in. So people are traveling from all around the world. We recently had a, um, a young Chinese woman stay with us and work with us. And she, we did a podcast with her about the new peasants in China and how very, you know, city educated and, um, you know, in framed young people are actually heading back into regional China to grow food and to, to rebuild the village. They're missing something. And so, um, yeah, so in terms of like worrying about being looked after, I think because we're so embodied now in with young people behind us that are, you know, um, there's beautiful, loving relationships with those below us generationally and those above us. I feel like this is, again, with the insurance thing, like with the house, uh, if we're isolated, yeah, we need insurance. If we're isolated, yeah, we need to, you know, plan for our retirement. Um, but if if we give away the, the threat of scarcity, um, by you know being sort of manipulated by the monetary economy um or or that kind of mentality which we're schooled into very early um if we can deindustrialize and demonetize our minds and build relationships then we are going to be in a much better place so we can be in service to others when we, when we're capable and then you know the, the, there's only the hope that the, the younger folk will um, aid us and our children will aid us. But that may not happen either. But I'm I'm not going to be living my life in fear that that doesn't happen. I'm going to just basically keep serving the world with generosity and, and not kind of hope because I don't want to put pressure on other people. I don't want it to be a, I'm doing this, therefore, you know, this must happen to me. If it doesn't, that's my journey. I like... Um, uh, Stephen Jenkinson, he it's a Canadian American, yeah, Canadian um, death doula, an amazing thinker. Um, but he he says like, you can't have a good death unless you have a good life. And I think a good life is like facing our fears, opening to grief, um, being like uh, alive to the possibilities of change and renewal, to be open to our wild twin, what Michael um, Martin Shaw the English storyteller calls our wild twin or our shadow. Um, these sorts of things are so important um, to, to not get stuck and uh, retracted and small in a story of fear. Like I often find myself going, oh, wow, I've been carrying this fear for ages. I'm going to, I'm going to really go into this fear. And, you know, one of the big fears, I wrote a poem about this and it's on our website called i I fear the, the culture I was born into. And it's all about just what happened to us in COVID. The first time we saw governments actively giving permission, fanning a kind of social violence onto people like us. It's like, I've never experienced anything like that. Um, it's like, that's what I feared. I didn't fear a virus or whatever that thing was, a, a pathogen. I feared... Stupidity. Um, what was that? You said, I feared, and then I put a word in there, stupidity, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, stupidity that um, could, yeah, could it lead to incarceration and so certainly subjugation. We were locked out of swimming pools, um, municipal buildings, the li local library where we get our books. Um, we were, like, yeah, segregated. Uh, it was only for a short time, but... I've got many indigenous friends here in Australia and um, it was actually a good process for me to, it, you know, it's not generational segregation um, and trauma in that way, but it, it was enough of a period of time to understand what my indigenous friends have felt um, being, yeah, born into this culture. So, uh, you know, there are gifts in that. There are absolute gifts, but there was also this fear coming out of COVID is like, and no one wanting to talk about it, particularly those who had, you know, gone along with the, with the, with the narrative. So, um, and it, it just made, it just made me think, well, what's the next thing? 
what's coming up where all of, all of a sudden those of us from a heterodox or dissenting perspective are, are once again uh, put into a position where uh, we're threatened. Um, our livelihoods were threatened. Um, I mean, luckily for us, because we grow our own food and resources and energy and stuff, we weren't threatened. We were like really, we had our cellar was full, our wood stacks were full, our seed banks were full. The richness of life that because we're in relationship, our economy is in relationship with the living of the world. And yeah, and, and just wait, not to interrupt you, Patrick, but just wait until they ban at home gardens because it's environmentally yeah. unfriendly. That's going to be the next move, I bet you. Yeah, exactly. And look, we're already seeing in the state government here in Victoria, um, like policies coming in, which stops hunters from shooting a rabbit and sharing that rabbit with a neighbor, even if it's for cat food. You know, like there is this biosecurity risk of a potential wild animal transmitting some terrible toxin that could you know wipe us all out or something you know like the the hyper yeah the the insanity and uh of of these policies and we've just got varroa mite in australia after years and years of not having it in well in europe and in north america every apris knows that you need to build Im immunity by getting some of the kick -ass us black Russian bees to populate the more sort of cultivated and slightly weak Italian bees in the honeybee populations. And in that wildness and that robustness of the of the Russian bees, you can build um, a, a, mu a gr great immunity to varroa mites. Now, that that is not going to serve Bayer chemicals and the government relationship that um, <laughs> Bayer has that is not going to make them a lot of money. So what we're seeing is Bayer coming in with the solution to the problem and just bees being destroyed in Australia. And industry gets paid, so they'll get, um, you know, there'll be some sort of corporate welfare that comes from the big industry, but the small backyard beekeepers um, and, you know, much smaller aprists are getting punished for that. Like, so, yeah, there's all sorts of stuff that's coming that I'm really keeping a close eye on um, because that's what happened to our peasant ancestors. There were all these policies. There were peasants that were whipped um, for not attending church on a Sunday um, if they were found tending their tomato patch because it was the only day of the week where they weren't being subjugated to a kind of slavery um, in in once the enclosures started. But so, you know, um, they were publicly whipped for growing tomatoes. And this, this is actually documented in the records in that book, The Invention of Capitalism, that I mentioned. So there is this... Um, yeah, this is repeat. Like, how are we going to? And that's why we call ourselves n n new peasants. We we go right there. Like, we are recommoning uh, with our goats and sheep. We are recommoning in terms of building culture on the commons, like the men's and women's circles and the storytelling that happens around those fires. We are like the men have got. We call ourselves fire choir. We are writing songs. None of us are particularly musical. There's a few of us who who are, but songs are coming out of that fire that are really meaningful and beautiful to we men singing them. And we're, sing you know, like we, we, we don't live in, in settler Australia, men don't get together and sing, but like somehow we've kind of worked out, found our way there. And anyone that's ever been in a community choir knows the incredible oxytocin or serotonins that are given off when we sing together. And I, I look at some of the beautiful, um, you know, Russian men choirs or Eastern European choirs uh, of, yeah, of men like sitting in the snow singing together. And there's just such beauty and beautiful masculinity there. And so, yeah, we're, we're reculturing um, in, in many ways. And so that's a, a long winded way of saying, um, saying, yeah, quite a few things. <laughs> Got it. Well, Patrick, thank you. Thank you for being a guest uh, guest on the show. Pleasure. Can you share like any kind of information if people want to like take courses from you or like a website or anything of that sort? 
Yeah, sure. Yeah, if you go to artistasfamily.is, um, uh, that's Icelandic um, uh, code. Um, yeah, so artistasfamily.is or is, and uh, we're also on YouTube, although we don't post there anymore. We're trying to get away from, um, yeah, we're trying to direct people to subscribe to independent websites where we don't do anything with your we don't sell on your uh, private information. And so we're, we're yeah, we but we do have like 10 years of good educational stuff in this space um, on YouTube. But yeah, we're, we're posting everything uh, to our website. So yeah, subscribe and um, yeah, check us out. Patrick, I hate to keep you for another two minutes, but this is important because I struggle with this one too, because I kind of want to get off the social media platforms as well. But I kind of feel like, you know, Neo, he had to plug into the matrix to get people out of the matrix. You know what I mean? Do you ever get that feeling too, that by excluding yourself from all these like really popular sites, you're kind of leaving a sustainable message out of a lot of people's ears that really do need to hear or want to even hear it, not even need to hear it. Yeah, I think we used Instagram as micro bloggers and YouTube to, you know, demonstrate what we're doing. And they were great for that the amount of time. We got a lot of interest in our work and we had thousands and thousands of followers, but it also came with a lot of noise, a lot of replying to comments. And mm -hmm. so by going to an independent website, we're getting just a very, you know, high quality um, readership of of our uh, uh, stuff so it is reduced the numbers but it's actually more i i guess uh focused and so th that's what we're saying that yes you know we will still use youtube to find something out about fishing or you know hunting or you know beautiful stories like happen films is an incredible uh filmmaking company out of new zealand and australia and their their films are really inspiring in this space um, so yeah, that it's not like we're, but, but certainly reducing the noise of social media and those big tech platforms, reducing the power they have in our lives. We are just being manipulated like, um, by those companies, um, in algorithmically and in other ways. So yeah, just being like discerning when we go to those spaces, but not being part of it ourselves and then drawing over the years. Yeah we were on those things for, you know, 15 years. And then we're, we're drawing a more discerning readership and listenership and viewership over to our independent site. And so the, yeah, the comments is less work, but it's more meaningful. Yeah. So that, it, but it has been a process. I think, I think building, building community and building numbers and it, it is an incredible tool. I mean, YouTube is incredible. Um, and if it wasn't so predatorial, it'd just be the most wonderful thing, but it, it, it should always come with a warning. Got it. Okay, Patrick. Well, thank you again. I really do appreciate that you took the time to do this. And again, I appreciate that you reminded me it was today, not tomorrow so, <laughs> of the time zone difference. So thank you again. And of course, wishing you and your family the best. Um, and thank you forever, whoever, uh, sat in on the show as well. Thank you guys. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Eugene. Thanks for tuning into the podcast. If you've ever had trouble losing weight, or you've lost weight, but still didn't have the ideal body or health you're aiming for, please feel free to reach out anytime and book an assessment. Eugene will work with you to cover your goals in detail, see what's holding you back, and go from there. In the meantime, feel free to check out the countless testimonials on Eugene's website in the link below. In the testimonial section you'll notice everyone has various backgrounds, are of all different ages, and all have had different challenges in their life, but they all have one thing in common, they were all able to find their health and achieve their ideal body. You're also welcome to add yourself to the Facebook group in the link below. There you'll have access to the live videos that Eugene does weekly on Sundays and other helpful content. Thank you again for tuning in.